Joe. Joe on Joe is the only podcast where Joe talks about Joe. And now, your host, Joe Slepsky. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Joe on Joe. It's me, your host, Joe Slepsky. And this week, we are once again diving into Joe on Joe Illustrated territory as we cover the hijinks of G.I. Joe issue number 64. Last week, we covered 63, where Snake Eyes, the Blind Master, and Scarlet found themselves blowed up real good by a mine in uh, Grenada, Grenada. Let's call the whole thing off. This month picks up, and it also, it by the way, it cliffhangered with uh, Fred Seven leaving from Galveston in a boat on his way to Cobra Island. So this month uh, picks up right where the action is. Uh, And before we start into that action, we're going to hear a little word from our sponsor. Listeners, I know what you need in your life. You need more podcasts. And you also love movies. So why not do a podcast that's about not, not one movie? It's about not two movies. It's about three movies and a meal. I'm talking the movies and a meal podcast. This show is great. It's brought to you by Keith, Brad, and Ben, and each week they bring a new movie to the table, which they all discuss as a group. And it's not, you know, your highfalutin movies. It's what we do in the shadows, the Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer, and Out of Sight. You know, it's Bad Education, Ghost Rider, and A View to a Kill. It's X-Men Last Stand, Queen Sugar, The Mandalorian, and Major League Two. They are... A lot of fun to listen to. You guys know Ben. It's our friend Ben Penserga. He was a guest on Joe and Joe. In fact, Ben was the very first remote guest that I ever had on this podcast. So he's always got a special place in my heart. I'm really digging this. I, I just started listening to it last week. It is a lot of fun. They bring a guest in. The guest, uh, I, I listened to their Heather's episode. They they were joined by Kelly. And she went in depth on her favorite movie, which was Heather's. And it made me want to go watch Heather's to watch with them. I really dig it. So guys, find them out there at Movies and a Meal, Twitter, Instagram. Their website is moviesandameal.podbean.com. They put out one episode a week. Give them a listen, guys. Support them. Let them know Joe on Joe sent you. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. It is quite entertaining. And now back to the show. That's right, guys. Listen to Movies and a Meal. And while you're on the internet, adding Movies and a Meal podcast to your podcast catcher, you need to go on to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and you need to add at Joe on Joe pod and follow me and let me know what you think of the show. Send me a note, send me a hello, send me an email to Joe and Joe pod at gmail.com. Leave a review on your podcatcher. If you're on, if you're on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you're listening to this, leave a review. Let me know what you think of the show. I always one. I always love hearing it because it's great to know that you guys are out there listening. And two, Uh, It always helps the algorithms. So the more people leave reviews, even if it's just a star rating, wherever you're at, then uh, these podcatchers, they tend to promote it more. And so more people hear about the show and the show grows and we spread the love of G.I. Joe. And we know G.I. Joe is super uh, spreading these days because uh, all you guys trying to catch uh, Vipers and Firefly at Target, you guys know it is in demand. G.I. Joe is flying off the shelf. It is due for a renaissance. So we are here for you. Before we start digging into G.I. Joe number 64, we're going to start with our favorite segment. You were saying. Thanks, Stalker. Now, we're going to look at books that were on the shelf uh, during, in this case, October of 87. And other comic books, this time by the publisher. um, It's a little known publisher, uh, Marvel. Marvel Comics. Uh, You guys are familiar with them? Yeah. So, um, G.I. Joe. October 87, that's the, that's the, they call it again, oh God, I feel like, I don't want to say this every show, they call it the cover date, it's actually the take it off shelves date, but it is history, as time passes, that's what everyone's doing. The biggest thing on the shelves during the month that this book hit the shelf, hit the stands, uh, is in the Spider-Man books, without a doubt, uh, it's Craven's Last Hunt, uh, it starts in, I believe, Web is the first one? Web of Spider-Man is the first issue of Craven's Last Hunt. And then it goes to Spectacular, and then I believe Amazing. So, yeah, let's see. Yeah, Web 31, then Amazing Spider-Man, number 293. That's part two. Then it goes to Spectacular Spider-Man, number 131. That's part three of Craven's Last Hunt. It's a six-part story. 
uh, it follows in that order uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the next month as well. If you've never read Craven's Last Hunt, do yourself a favor, get it. It's available anywhere you get your books. Uh, it's been collected a billion times. It's one of my early Spider-Man, real Spider-Man stories that I read like as a whole arc. Um, it's dark. It's depressing. And it's wonderful. And it's also drawn by G.A. Joe stalwart Mike Zeck. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, the top notes are Spider-Man is getting stalked by Craven the Hunter, his longtime enemy, who is, you know, a bit of a joke, always been a bit of a joke. But Craven basically goes insane, for real. And he stalks Spider-Man, and he supplants him. And that's all I'm going to say for you uh, no-spoiler people out there, but it's it's told fabulously, absolutely fabulously. There's subplots, and there's... Um, just wonderful, wonderful images by Mike Zex. Uh, if you've never read Craven's Last Hunt, d- do that right now. When you're done listening to this podcast and when you're done following me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, when you're done sending me an email and when you're done reviewing Joe and Joe Pod, then go to you know Comixology and get it digitally or go to your local, I prefer you to go to lo- your local comic book shop and pick up a copy of Craven's Last Hunt because it is fabulous. Also this month on Heathcliff 19, Heathcliff standing on a scale. Turns out Heathcliff fat. Who knew? Heathcliff, you're getting fat. Wolverine and Sabretooth go at it in X-Men 222. And this book actually was uh, uh, really good. And it's I th- so I think it's technically their, only their second uh, Wolverine and Sabretooth fight. It's a follow-up to the Mutant Massacre fight. Um, it's probably worth about, I think about 20 bucks in the back issue market these days. That's what we sell it for 15 or 20 bucks. I believe, um, you probably could find one around 10 or 15 if you looked hard enough. Uh, but it's great. It's a, it's a solid issue and it's drawn by Mark Silvestri in his early, you know, his early X-Men years when his pencils were really tight and, um, just energetic and powerful and, and wonderful. So that's it, man. Those are, those are, those are strong books for Marvel comics. Now, DC comics, you were saying, Art Adams does the cover for Action Comics Annual Number One. Now, this is Action after the reboot, so it's uh, it's 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 Annual One after it's the book's been around for fifty years. But um, <laughs> uh, it's an awesome Art Adams cover. I love just love seeing Art Adams art. And he's drawing Batman and Superman, and I think they fight a vampire in it, if memory serves, and if the cover is not lying to me. Um, more exci- <laughs> interestingly, uh, it's excited. But uh, in Action Five Ninety Three, this is the second part of a of a. Superman, Fourth World, John Byrne, uh, Kirby Homage crossover. It's got Superman make it out with Big Barda. And I believe uh, this is that. Byrne did this a couple times. He did it with uh, Big Barda. He did it with She-Hulk, where like he had these third-party people either mesmerize them, in this case, into falling in love with Superman, or like also getting like nude pictures and publishing them in Playboy and things like that. There was always this level of like, Going back to that well that John Byrne did a few times in the in the eighties, that was always a little like, really, all right, we're doing it. But um, but you get to see Byrne draw the fourth world characters, which you know he was Kirby was a big influence on his stuff, and it looks great. Like his his rendition of Miracle and Barda are fantastic, and obviously I love his Superman. So, um, it's a fun it's a fun little two parter. Doom Patrol Volume 2 Number 1 is on the stands. So if you guys have seen the Doom Patrol TV show, that's uh, I believe it's currently on HBO Max, but originally it was on the DC streaming app. Friend of the show, Phil Morris, you guys, he was a guest on Joe on Joe. He's on the Doom Patrol TV show. He played Vic Stone's father in that. Um, the show is great. The show takes place in this series continuity. And so this series ran, it was a little more traditional superhero-y, and it ran for uh, it was eighteen or nineteen issues with this uh, this lineup of like um, Robot Man and Negative Man and um, Celsius I think, uh, and then there was a, and they wore the red and black costumes which I thought looked pretty good, but it only ran that way and it had a little bit of Eric Larson art in it at some point I believe this first one is it's got a Steve Lytle cover and I think he did interiors too, it only ran about eighteen issues in this version but they never rebooted it they just brought in grant morrison and i believe it was issue 19 that grant morrison said yeah we're just gonna go crazy with it very much like uh alan moore did with swamp thing a couple years earlier where he said yeah we're just we're already in the middle of a run of swamp thing we're just gonna restart it i don't know where you guys stand on this personally i love that they honor the book 
more than the creative change. So they could have, you know, nowadays, absolutely, they would have restarted it with a Doom Patrol number one when Grant Morrison came on, and it just would have had a stand on its own. I adore that in issue 19, it just starts being a different book. Um, you know, creative changes. And and within that, they, they try to integrate them as much as possible, but really it's just a brand new different book. I love it because it makes it easier to follow if you're a reader. It gives you like these these really peculiar starting points for things that make, I think, make the ha- hobby more interesting. You know, it's how you get uh, X-Men 137 being, you know, the death of Jean Grey. You know, not like 150 or 125 or 100. All that kind of stuff, and and in this case, that that's the case with this Doom Patrol run. It's fun. Um, it's I've got all these issues. They're you know they're kind of standard superhero stuff. Doom, Doom Patrol is pretty cool. A bunch of weirdos fighting the world, but then Morrison comes in and just like does acid and tells it in a really wildly different way. Um, which those books are great, and I I like those too. But this is the start of it. Issue one's on the stand uh, as as GI Joe sixty four also hit the stand. So that's cool. Legion of Superheroes Annual Five. This is, I believe it's called, the story's called The Promise. I'm going to click on this and see if I find out. Doing it live. We're going to do it live. I was wrong. <laughs> but it's called Child of Darkness, Child of Light. But what it is about is the, that uh, during the Great Darkness Saga, Darkseid kidnapped one of Imra's children and ra- turned him into Validus their telepathic lightning throwing monster enemy. And this is the, uh, the payoff to that. I think the promise is, is was the story where I think the promise was the story where we see that happening because when dark side left during the great darkness saga, he made like, I promise I'll be back. And I think the promise was the name of her giving birth. And like the lights went out and all of a sudden they were like, we thought there were two kids, but there's only one because remember Garth, uh, uh, when Athians have twins and so they would expect twins to happen, but there was only one, uh, Graham and Garridan, I want to say. And then I believe if memory serves, this is the issue that they kind of told the full story that yeah, dark side kidnapped their child at birth without them knowing it. And here you go. They've been fighting. Validus is their own child all this years. Either way, it's awesome. And then they followed up with it in the five years later, Legion. Fabulous. I love it. Love it. It's a storyline that I think never really got its final due because then the kid just stayed young forever and they said he had the Validus disease, but they never really followed up on it. I would have loved to have seen Validus like hit that version of it and make a comeback because they brought Validus back. I'm getting into deep Legion talk here. I apologize. But they brought Validus back, but they never really kind of, they just, they rebooted it and never really addressed that it. it was supposed to be their kid and so on and so forth. Any hoots. Watchmen number 12. That is a huge book. It is the culmination of Watchmen. Obviously, everyone listening must know how great Watchmen is. And this is the final issue of Watchmen. Also this month, it's Wonder Woman number nine, which was a big cheetah issue. And that ties in with this month uh, the on HBO Max, the new Wonder Woman 84 movie, which if you haven't seen it yet, count yourself lucky. I'm not going to spend time uh, bashing it. I'm just going to say there's a lot of problems with that movie. I I'm shocked that they made that movie because the first Wonder Woman was amazing. And this seemed to say everything you loved about that first movie. Let's get rid of it. Uh, Let's make a completely different movie about other people and not give Wonder Woman anything to do and have a whole bunch of plot problems that are not just handily waved away with a wish. And let's make a sequel to Wishmaster. Anyway, that's for another podcast. But this Wonder Woman 9, this is a George Perez, uh, his take on Cheetah, and it's it's pretty good. It's a good starting point. If you want to look at like what the modern-day Cheetah kind of stems from, this Wonder Woman 9 is really, really good place to do that. So that's DC Comics. You were saying. And now we're going to take a look at the movie theater and see what was in theaters in October of 87. Let's see. Oh, like Father, like Son, that's a body switch movie. Speaking of Wonder Woman and body switching, uh, that's with Dudley Moore and Kirk Cameron. Uh, Dudley Moore, rest in peace. Kirk Cameron, I wish you were resting in peace. Uh, you're terrible. It, it was charming. It was a charming body swap movie that was big in the 80s. Okay. Uh, but the big deal is on October 9th, it's The Princess Bride. Uh, fabulous movie. And, you know, obviously a modern day fairy tale, things, so on and so forth. But also on this day, three o'clock high. Never seen it. You're missing out. Uh, I haven't seen it in a long time. But it's got uh, uh, Casey Shimasco, Shimasco, and he gets in trouble 
with the bully, um, who I believe is Richard Tyson. And the bully's like, I'm going to beat your ass at three o'clock. Uh, and so he has to go through. So it's like the, the day is clicking down to three o'clock high. Um, it's like high noon, like that kind of a thing where at come three o'clock, he's going to get his butt beat and the whole school knows it. And it's, it's awesome. If you've never seen three o'clock high, please seek it out. It's such a charming, charming movie. Yeah. Oh, Paul Figg's in it. Yardley Smith. I remember Yardley Smith being in it. She's the, of course the voice of Bart Simpson. Um, oh, Mitch Pelegi from X-Files. That's fun. Uh, Jeffrey Tambor, Philip Baker Hall. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a cock high. It's a good movie. On October 16th, Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night 2. Unre- it's, I mean, it's related to, because it's around Prom Night, but it's like kind of unrelated to the first Prom Night, if you've ever seen the first one with Jamie Lee Curtis. Prom Night 2 is fun. Like, it's really fun. It's like the ghost of someone who died in the, in the 50s, and she comes back and uh, gets her revenge. It's, it's, it's not a terrible movie. It's actually pretty fun. On October 23rd, the great Paul Newman in Glass Menagerie. I actually don't think I've ever seen this one. I love Paul Newman. Uh, but he's in it with uh, Joanne Woodward, John Malkovich, Karen Allen. I mean, that's got to be amazing. And it's, you know, it's Tennessee Williams, uh, writ- written by Tennessee Williams. And, of course, ever seen Cat on the Hot Tin Roof. Uh, it, Paul Newman's fabulous in, when he's when he's chewing uh, Tennessee Williams dialogue. So um, I need to see Glass Menagerie. And uh, at the, the end of the month, uh, this is kind of a big one, but a little not necessarily for, like, the younger set at the time, but Baby Boom. Uh, with Diane Keaton about like a middle-aged woman, you know, she, can she have it all? And she decides, you know, she gets a baby and she, and like, how is she going to juggle it all? And this was one, it's, I think it's a charming movie. I've seen it. I don't remember hating it. Um, it was huge. It was a huge movie because it was like this, like, um, groundbreaking, like, you know, women can have it all or, or, you know, we can, this moment, this watershed moment where then this movie became shorthand in, in, in popular discussion about like, c- can a woman have a career and a baby and juggle everything? And, and it, this really became the, the Kleenex of, of movies for that. Um, it's good. So yeah, baby boom came out, uh, October 30th. It doesn't really tie in with GI Joe, but it was out there guys. So let's dig into GI Joe number 64. What we've got here is a game of dirty pool with a capital D for death row. Great cover by Ron Wagner. I don't, I don't love it. Just because it's, um, it's, it's just, it's, it's a, mm, it's very static. I think my issue with the cover is static, but it looks great. Like the, the, um, the, uh, execution of it is, is solid. I think you're getting good emotion. You're getting good anger from Serpentor. Um, you're getting good, like disbelief shock from Baroness. It's the one where Baroness and Serpentor are on either side of, of, Cobra Commander's face, but it's Fred Seven in Cobra Commander's armor, and Fred's just kind of staring at us. I don't know. It's just it's a very static cover. It's not certainly not rendered poorly. It's just I don't know why it just sits there. It lays there on the page for me. I think maybe if you get this same cover, and you and you're able to do it where the and obviously it wouldn't work here, but the Cobra Commander face is shown. So we can see more of what's going on. Because right now his eyes look just focused and intent. I kind of can't see as much of what is he, you know, what's he doing? Because he's staring right into us, which is fun. But I can't really read what's going on. And maybe that's what they're going for. Because that's certainly Serpentor and Baroness aren't supposed to be able to read, you know, who he is even. But yeah, so that's always been my thought on this cover. It's always, it's never really stood out for me as, um, as like a standout cover too. And I wonder if, if the background color being um you know it's like dark purple which meshes with the blue the blue on cobra commander and even the and even the um uh the 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 grunt box up top that has you know the gi joe the grunt uh figure in the corner that's also blue i mean it's just a little too much blue like i don't know i wonder if uh you know like maybe like a just a bright something else color but then that might contrast with serpentor because it does make serpentor pop but then that's only on the one side of the page and with Baroness's hair also being blue and black, there's something, yeah, there's just something about this. I don't, I don't know. And, you know, normally Mike Zuck's been doing these covers too. Uh, also, Mike Zuck is doing a big month of Spider-Man. So I'm assuming that he's not doing this cover because his workload is focusing on those Spider-Man books, which rightfully so. So possibly, throw this out there, 
Maybe this was a little bit of a last minute cover. Maybe they were like, oh, shoot, Ron, we need a cover from you. And this is what we got. Uh, it's pure conjecture. But if you look at what else was being published and, and Zach's workload, it kind of makes sense. Because remember, they were still doing covers that actually related to the contents of the book, which I think is vital and crucial and needed for comic books. And they don't do that anymore. Yo, Joe! All right, get off my lawn. It's called Maneuvering for Position. Larry Hama, script. Ron Wagner. Awesome pencils. This next one, I'm very excited. I was real excited to see this. I didn't, I wasn't expecting it. Inks by Russ Heath, the legend Russ Heath. Uh, coloring by Neil Yamtov. Lettering by Joe Rosen. Editor is, is Bob Harris. And in chief is Jim Shooter. We talked about this, five, well, 40 some issues ago when Russ Heath illustrated that one issue in the 20s of G.I. Joe. And uh, Russ Heath is a legend, uh, mili- known for his military stuff. His attention to detail is just f- staggeringly phenomenal uh and even on a toy like even russ heath wasn't he was like, into gi joe toys but this was a job where he's like oh no here's here are here's the toys you need to you need to ink you know and between him and wagner everything in this issue looks awesome and tight and great and really nice inking great layouts great pencil work like this it, this is a good looking book and that's all ron wagner and russ heath um, sadly, Russ died a couple of years ago. I know he was living out here in California and actually a friend of the show, uh, Jesse Campbell, uh, used to help him out and used to, uh, you know, like, like help him, help him around, help him, you know, get to, get to places. Cause he's a big, Jesse's a great guy and he's a big fan of Russ and old school comics and stuff. Uh, comic artists, not comics, although he might like old comedians. I don't know. So it's, uh, and I know, I know that Jesse was good friends with Russ. He used to help him get around places. So, uh, big respect, big respect for Russ Heath guys. If you're not familiar with his work, uh, do a little, do a little research cause you're going to find some amazing stuff. So we open with, uh, a couple of Mambas kind of bearing down on, um, cap was a captain Min's boat warning them there men's refusing to answer radio calls and everything we got missiles firing i mean it's a really cool perspective it's a it's a nice uh it's a nice little tutorial in perspective you can you can just see the vanishing point and you see all these action lines and it just takes your eye from anywhere on the page and it focuses you on that boat it's really good Yo, Joe! and look at the face on men he is just he's awesome he's character he's screaming it's awesome the, 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 uh, throughout this entire issue, the level of detail, the inking, everything looks great. And I think, from again, for my money, this is the kind of detail work, this is the kind of art style that I think G.I. Joe works best in. You can certainly experiment with flashier styles or newer styles or more cartoony styles or, or whatever. Um, but for me, this type of realism in the inking and the shading and, you know, and shadows and, and, and lots of lots of spotted blacks... That works best for G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe always needs to have a foot in the real world. When it gets a little too cartoony, um, not to pick them out, pick on them, but the most recent example is, you know, the McFarlane stuff. Uh, when it gets a little bit into that flashy image, new style that was burgeoning at the time, I don't like it. I don't think it works for G.I. Joe. I think th- th- there's a sweet spot for G.I. Joe that a real American hero always, always hit. Um, so this is just another example. So, so men's screaming Fred seven is, is now he's got, he's put on the Cobra commander armor and, uh, that he designed men's calling him crazy. Fred gets in the pogo and he leaps off the boat as it explodes. I, I said last issue, I thought men lived. I do think he lives. I think he shows up and, and I might be wrong guys. Um, you know, feel free to spoil it for me, but we'll get there. Um, I swear to you, I thought men shows up at some point down the road, but as far as I can tell right now, g- goodbye, Captain Man. Yo, Joe! And the Pogo has launched. Um, now, I'll say this, though. Over water, I don't know what the Pogo is jumping off of. Once it gets off that boat, that first jump, exactly know how it's f- zooming around. Because I thought the whole idea of the Pogo was like afterburners or you know it's like a it's like a it's like a retro rocket to stop it from crashing and then it pogos back up in the air you know to constantly bounce around how that's bouncing around in over and over open ocean which is absolutely where they're still at i don't understand it but that's okay he manages to uh, uh he manages to uh get uh get the jump on one of those mamas now this is really cool this panel in the middle where it's the pilot looking over his shoulder now I want to say we covered the whole Russ Heath, Roy Lichtenstein theft 
in our last issue. I'm pretty sure we talked about it. But if you're not familiar, Roy Lichtenstein, who made millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, by pop, quote, pop arting uh, actual real artists' comic books, um, he, he, he stole from Russ Heath a lot. Uh, and uh, one of the ones that he did, and I just found it, is is what I think this panel's referencing uh, is a is a pilot who's like who's in the foreground and you know he's screaming something and in the back right over his shoulder you see the oncoming uh, the on, the enemy coming you know approaching him from behind and um, it looks like it's called a uh, okay hot shot okay that's what Lichtenstein named it um, but I believe that's that's stolen from a Russ Heath drawing. And I believe that's what they're doing in this picture. So if if that is if that was intentional, I love it because it's a great great panel. Um, Google it, guys. Check it out. You'll see what I'm talking about. You'll see the reference. You'll see the the similarities there. And then please keep googling the Liechtenstein uh, Heath stuff. Uh, it's really disgusting and it's really really unfortunate. Heath did a couple. Um, he did an actual comic book about it where he kind of, you know, had his say about it, but it, it's really unfortunate cuz he his images just made a lot of people a lot of money. And I don't know that's the story of comics, but his is really like in 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 full view of the world, he got ripped off. Check that out. We're not going to go into more detail now. We're talking GI Joe, but check it out and then come back to this book. Or no, finish this, then go back to it, then find it out, and then appreciate these panels because these are great, great panels that we're getting in a GI Joe comic of like aerial war action. Um, and the the Pogo manages to knock one of those mambas out. Yo, Joe! Now uh, they're getting closer to the mainland. Which again, I go, how did the Pogo? How was the Pogo jumping in the first place? But. Uh, they're closer to the mainland, so Cobra can actually uh, it's Cobra Island mainland actually, so they can th- some asps look like the asps can track on them and shoot. But they're like, oh, they're too close. The two the two planes are too close. Superventor does not care. He says shoot them both down, and he proceeds to shoot down his own Mamba, and he doesn't miss hit the Pogo. Now remember, they don't know what the Pogo is. The Pogo was built and designed by Fred, just like he built and designed the armor. It has Cobra symbols on it, but. He, they don't, they have no idea who this person is. The, there's a bit in here of detail that I love, especially because it's drawn by Ron Wagner and Russ Heath, two artists who I don't think were, I mean, this is, this had to be put in the notes. Like they wouldn't have known, I don't, you know, I don't think this would have been on their radar to include. So this had to be in Larry's notes. Uh, the, the tanker, the, the, that later on, you know, everyone gets, um, uh, trapped in and dies and when Cobra Island eventually, you know, blows up. But that was also on the island that carried the bombs. You know, you guys know the tanker that I'm talking about. It's in this picture, which is great because it's like a nice little landmark reminder that, yeah, Cobra Island is all centered around this giant decrepit tanker that was on the bottom of the ocean that eventually got risen up when Cobra Island was surfaced from all the nuclear weapons or TNT, rather, not nuclear weapons. But the detail on Serpentor in these pages is fabulous. This fourth panel, that's that's such Roy, that's such a, a Russ Heath this middle panel, the middle panel on the right with the womp and the whoosh, that's absolute Russ Heath. Like, war. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. And it makes me think, if Ron Wagner drew that, it makes me think he was referencing Heath's, knowing that Heath was going to ink it. He was referencing Heath, Heath's war stuff to get this type of angles. Because these are the kind of angles that Heath used to put into his war books. Um, and and I, I love it. I think it's great collaboration. Um, and just the level of detail and everything, man. Yeah, you got these asps. There, you got the asp in the background. A lesser artist, they would have just drawn this bottom panel. They would have just drawn the um, the, the cobra soldier in the foreground asp, and they would have drawn uh, serpentor, and they would have just done a background. But they took the time to give us a secondary asp to kind of give some depth to the photo. I think it's great. Yo, Joe. So now the uh, the pogo lands. There's a little bit of stillness. I love that panel and the selection of angles on it because it's it's worm's eye view we still have the um uh, the 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 engines are smoking from the pogo everything's still sealed the tanks have closed in there's no more sound effects so it's not no no one's moving all the vehicles are still and all we get is the the loudspeaker you know slowly come out with your hands up and of course you know it ends with uh, uh fred saying that he's cobra commander Yo, Joe! and what a great place to shift story again that's the master of larry hama you you start with some slam bang action you give us a little bit of misdirect and then you 
and then you end it with a cliffhanger, you know, and it's a page turner cliffhanger too, which is always the most exciting because it's, oh my God, I need to get to the next page. And then you go to the next page and there's a pressure release because now you're not, you're still not on Cobra Island. Now you're back in Utah. So there's this, Ooh, now we got to change gears. It's, it's, um, it's playing with the, uh, it's playing with the tempo really. And, and it's fabulous. So now we're, uh, we are at those Quonset huts. Can't technically call it the pit yet. Cause technically we don't know what it is guys. Spoiler. And we see that w- those Joes from issue 60 that we've seen that were kind of, uh, they, that they were duped into thinking they were on a weird GI Joe team, which was a weird, crazy, odd subplot. Strangely went nowhere. Um, <laughs> but they're, they're finally joining up with the real GI Joe team. So we're talking Falcon chuckles, law and order, um, fast draw, and now they've also added psych out and um, blast uh, backstop. Backstop, who drives uh, the persuader? I think um, these guys were also in some of the special mission stuff, which we will be doing. I am skipping them for now, unless they're the crossover, because I believe I'm going to be doing them on the Patreon guys. So you know, go on to Patreon.com/slash/JoinJoePod and check that out. But they're met by Crankcase, or actually, well, Crankcase drove them in on and uh, on the Ostracker, and they. Go in the side and and they're they're they see uh, Leatherneck who's standing pretty much alone in this giant empty Quonset hut. Yo, Joe! And Leatherneck, being a stickler that he is, uh, he's on Crankcase for letting these guys in without the proper clearance. So Crankcase is like, yeah, well, they're you know they're on the team, but the paperwork hasn't caught up to him, and Leatherneck's not letting it go. Like he's he's playing by the book, and this is fabulous characterization. You know, they're, they're Joe members, but they're not official Joe members. So you make, you give one of the guys who, you know, Leatherneck's perfect for it. If we know Leatherneck, anything from the cartoon, he was this guy. Uh, it's really great. And I think it's rare that there was the kind of continuity between the cartoon and the comic book of, of personalities. You know, I think it's easy to say like the Duke was Duke because that's, that's, your, that's your cookie cutter thing. But I'm talking about like these B level guys. Um, like, I don't think Shipwreck showed half the sass in the comic book that he did on the cartoon you know one he's barely in the comic to begin with but in these early days you know he'd show up and he was was an angry pirate but then that was it you know but on the cartoon he was just fully formed fleshed out guy because he was he was a lead a lot in leatherneck um and maybe it's because it's it's kind of an easy trope for that you know uh marine stickler for uh for rules and regulations you know maybe that's an easy uh i don't want want to say easy but maybe that's a, a really nice basic way to interpret that character either way it works i'm here for it so he says they ain't get, they, they're not i don't want to tell them about anything so like there's this mystery about what they're doing uh the 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 operation that they're up to and then there's a giant rumble Yo, Joe! and outside it's too dark for chuckles to see anything but he's asking about it and leatherneck's like i ain't telling you squat and in walks two dudes in uh like basically space gear now we know that they are payload and hardtop, and they're the uh, the defiant um, pilot. Um, let's see. So uh, payloads the 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 shuttle pilot, and hardtop was the what was he? The uh, he was the the crawler driver. So he drove the car that moved the that moved the defiant. Um, notably, the comic has payload drawn as African American. The toy, not so much. Uh, the toy looks he's kind of a kind of a redhead. Kind of a like a Caucasian-y looking redhead, but you know, I'm here for it. I think it's awesome. Just pointing out that, that there's a weird difference. But here's what I like. I like that uh, they don't go out of their way to name them. Like you know, a lot of times, especially in especially in GI Joe, because they have to name check everybody because they have to make sure that um, all the toys are you know identified so kids would be like, I want that guy in this scene because they're a part of what's supposed to be a need to know thing. No one says like, Hey, payload. Hey, you know, Hey, hardtop. Just there's two dudes. They walk in. We've never seen them before. The reader, uh, they're 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 not new to Leatherneck, but they're new to these dudes. So he, no one's going out of their way to introduce them. Like, hey, Chuckles, meet Leatherneck. Meet you know, blah blah blah, or meet uh, Payload, etc. So it's good. And yeah, and Leatherneck's just taking charge. Lots of great detail and acting and acting with the camera here. That angle on Chuckles' eye is fabulous up top. Yo, Joe. Now back on Cobra Island. Now it's it's just. Great ink work, lots of shadows. It's all taking place at night. They're still on the beach. Serpentor is not budging. 
And the the dreadnoughts show up to scream uh, like they want a cage match. That's how they want to find it. Because Sprinter doesn't believe that he's Cobra Commander. He's like, how do we know it's you? Uh, the dreadnoughts just want a cage match. They then, uh, all the soldiers, all the Cobra Troopers fall in line and are like, yeah, let's fight, fight. And you get a little bit of that Sage Zartan role, which he did have on the cartoon. And he absolutely has it in the, sh- in the, in the comic of like, He's an outsider, so he can kind of observe what's going on and 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 Riley comment on it. And he says, uh, "Your troops, you got you let your troops get bored, and bored troops get bloodthirsty." Yo, Joe! So this is a real challenge to Serpentor's rule here, uh, because the you know the prodigal son of of Cobra Commander, quote unquote Cobra Commander, has returned. What's he going to do about it? Meanwhile, uh, Baroness and Mindbender are returning. Now this is after the events of Special Mission Seven. Uh, and they're returning in one of those sweet Cobra chopper, choppers that they never made, that they should have. And at the end of this page, Zartan has a really great idea. Uh, the Baroness, she knows what Cobra Commander looks like under the hood. Let her decide. Which is an awesome pivot point to just launch a whole nother subplot. And Larry does not miss a beat. Count on it. Yo, Joe! Meanwhile in Utah, Psych Out and Chuckles aren't going to stand for it. Now, Chuckles is really the instigator here. Chuckles, he knows he got screwed over by that fake G.I. Joe team thing that they were doing in 60, which again is weird. Um, but whether or not that's weird, what I like is Larry didn't just drop it and ignore it. He he made that a part of Chuckles' motivation here because he made it a part of, like, that puts Chuckles on this, like, I don't trust anybody thing. And he's the spy. He's the infiltrator. You know, he's the undercover guy. So that makes sense that he'd he'd always be wary of everybody because he's always lying to everybody. He fills in Psych Out, like, because remember, Psych Out wasn't there for that. So he fills him in like, hey, man, I don't trust anything. You and me, let's go check this out. So they, they put on their boots, grab some flashlights. Um, ink work on this page, phenomenal. You're getting, uh, it's, it's heavy. Like, the page is really, really black, and yet, you're able to distinguish everything, like the the accents of all the it's not action, but all the the events that are taking place on this. Everything's rendered really clear. Great light sources, illuminating all the right places, leaving all the right shadows. Really, really great, great work. Um, especially like that last panel with the um, the flashlights. I love it when a flashlight doesn't show the full flashlight. It shows the light in their hand, and then it shows where it's illuminating on the ground. There's no like beam of light cutting through the air. I think that's always really cool. Yo, Joe! So they find these giant treads, and they're huge tracks, and tire tracks. They're huge tread tracks, and they're separated by like 50 feet, 50 yards? Yeah, 50 feet, which means it's a giant vehicle. Uh, And where could it go? It goes somewhere that just stops, just completely like an abrupt stop. Where did this giant vehicle go? And that's what caused the rumble earlier. Um, So it's a mystery for us. It's a mystery for them. Now, for us, what's here's what's neat about the way they kind of rolled this out. I think we all could kind of guess that they were working on a new pit early on, right? It's not a huge, like, going to be a surprise. But what they're still doing and they're still holding away from the reader is now what's this giant machinery, you know? Like, there's more than just this, okay, they're building a base under under the ground, and we don't yet know what that looks like and how they're going to access it, so that's going to be a fun revelation when it does. But now they've introduced this giant, massive something, and uh, and that's fun, you know? That's dude, So far, I mean, outside of the dudes that do look like they're in spacesuits, beyond that, I don't, you know, unless you were paying close attention to the, I guess if you are paying attention to the toy line, you would have known that those two were the pilots for the Defiant, but if you weren't, you don't really know what that is. So that's cool. That's a nice way to uh, kind of drag out a mystery for, you know, for another issue. Yo, Joe! So now we jumped to, to Marseille, France, which is uh, uh, just, we haven't been here before. And we also go back in time to like a, like an old swarthy, uh, like 1940s adventure movie, which uh, I'm here for it, man. <laughs> um, it's Snake Eyes and Scarlet, uh, and the blind master, they're getting off a boat. So they took a steamer. They took like a, a boat cruise from Granada all the way to Europe. Ah, that had to take forever. I'm just saying, I, I can't see that being quick passage, but they had to get in unseen. So over to Europe unseen. So that this is how they chose to do it from Granada to Marcel. And, and as they did it, there were these swarthy dudes straight out of, again, 
an old 40s adventure. It's like these guys, one of them's like almost dressed like Belloc from uh, Raiders Lost Ark. Uh, they're, they're straight out of Casablanca. And then they, they, they target these three as marks. They're going to steal them. You know, they figure they, uh, they're smuggling something into the country, drugs or, or diamonds or money or something like that. And so they think that they're easy marks. So that's what that's what they do. So so Snake is and and, and this is cool too, because Larry's setting up Snakes and Scarlet and Blindmaster. They're, they're obviously they're they're going to rescue um, Stalker and those guys, but instead of just putting them there, you know, or, or sending them on an infiltration thing, he's putting roadblocks in their way. And even if it's normal roadblocks, in this case, normal being your everyday thugs, you know, French thugs, which is awesome. Um, but you know, it's not like it's not overly complicating it with more Cobra shenanigans or things like that. It's just life. Life is getting in the way, and this is the adventure that they're going to go on. Yo, Joe! They get in a taxi cab, uh, and and we see that they're followed by these thugs in a couple cars, uh, and they've all got guns and Uzis and things like that. Also, uh, everyone's wearing sunglasses. Uh, And Blindmaster, also in sunglasses. Snake Eyes, also in sunglasses. Scarlet, the only one without sunglasses. Um, The Blindmaster's Vallis... uh, has a, a ball peen hammer, which we know he loves, and grenades and Uzis and all that stuff. And maybe that's why they had to take the boat, because they couldn't get any of that on any airplanes. Um, so he's going to take care of business. Yo, Joe! I mean, even the taxi cab looks like it's straight out of the 1940s, which is fabulous. So the cab um, is beset upon by these two cars, and they pull their guns, and you know everyone's ducking, because you know even the, none of them are bulletproof. But the blind master just straight up jumps out of the car, hits one of the windows with a ball peen hammer and throws a grenade in there with a five second fuse meanwhile he's yelling at them uh and the the cab takes off he crashes the cars together so single-handedly he physically takes out the two pursuing cars Yo, Joe! they both crash to uh like an apple cart again straight out of the vintage the classic movies and and the bad guys are are just they're determined to, to kill the blind master and this is just great timing these two pages we we you get the setup, you know, and this is the old um, like Hitchcock showing you a gun, so you have to fire it, kind of, or a bomb under the table, so you have to fire it, right? Chekhov's gun and Hitchcock's bomb under the table. Blindmaster introduces the grenade. Get, he tells us it's a five second timer. That five seconds then sets the pace for the for the rest of his adventure here. So he's counting down five, four, three, or three, one, two, three, four, five, and as he gets to five, uh, the explosion happens. Um, murdering, by the way. So we used to do a Snake Eyes kill count. Snake Eyes hasn't killed anyone in quite a while. We could start up the Blind Master kill count because he straight up murders those three dudes, um, which I'm fine with. They were terrible. Um, but it's a nice explosion. Very, very army explosion. But it's cool. It's a nice countdown. And smartly, the countdown ends on the, the, the end of the page. Like, it's a great way to break a page because now you also then narratively jump back into the taxi cab with Snake Eyes and Scarlet. Which is where, which is going to carry us and propel us on in the story. Imagine that um, explosion being like mid page and then on the bottom panel jumping over to, you know, Snake Eyes and Scarlet and thing. It doesn't have the impact, it doesn't have the push, you know? So just like, it's like a pacing tutorial for you guys. Yo, Joe! And here we are, Snake Eyes and Scarlet. Uh, you know, they're getting away and you see deep in, in deep background how far they are from it, uh, the smoke from the explosion. So the, the, they've they've gotten away from it. And by the end of the page, we see that Scarlet points out that he took his one-way ticket to Barovia with him. He expected, he he kind of figured uh, th- this was going to, in some way or another, was going to separate them. So they're able to continue on uh, their rescue operation. And as Scarlet says, if anyone can get Stalker, Snow Job, and Quick Kick out of Barovia, it's the three of us. This is wonderful. What's also great about the way, Larry, so a lot of times when Larry breaks these stories up with that have like the three subplots in it, he'll do like page, page, and then I'll do another couple pages of the next subplot. Then I'll circle back to it. what he's doing here is he's uh, is he's just taking an interlude in the middle of this book to to completely fill us in on where these guys are at. Just wrap it up, and then we're going to get back to the other two plots, which is you know what's going down in Utah and um, and what's primarily the A plot is what's going on at Cobra Island. Yo, Joe! So now the Baroness, she's going to jump back in that uh, the helicopter, and she's going to take a look at. at at Fred. And if and if he ain't Cobra Commander, us Dreadnoughts get to use your face for a hockey puck. That panel in the middle of those two staring at each other in silence is so good. Um, it's so good because it's it's then mirrored on the next page. 
and you get to the, the drawing. We'll get to this, but the, his and we'll get to this. But the rendering of his expression is is, is wonderful. But the silence in the middle of this page is 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 it's a it's a um it sets the tone for the inside of the helicopter, you know, because outside the helicopter is all tension and all anger and you know Cobra troops and guns and dreadnoughts screaming fight fight fight. Now you're inside the helicopter, and and even so much as to suggest with the um the checkerboard pattern that it's like somehow soundproof, you know, because it's a helicopter. Helicopters are very noisy. So I'm assuming that there's some sound dampening going on. Um, so that's also great. It's just this moment of, of respite in the middle of what's been a pretty hectic, chaotic day for Fred. I love that. He's not even going to bluff it. He knows his, his gig is up. Like that's it. He's not going to be able to lie to her. She knows he knows there's some friend like toy features also that goes on here talking about, um, the, the anti tamper explosive device in the, you know, in the helmet, which is always a neat little detail to give people something else to, you know, kind of play with. And he says, the game is up. Yo, Joe! And now this is that panel I was talking about. It mirrors the one on the other page, complete silence the whole time. She's not said a word. And now she's just staring at his face. She has the exact same expression. And you see that his look is, it's really remorseful. And this is where a, a wonderful illustrator like Wagner and Heath, they can really, they can tell a story with a look on, on a character's face. It's a real skill and it's a real skill to do it in a realistic way. Um, you know, you could do it in a cartoony way. That's, I think I'll, I'll use the word easier, but I'm not saying it's easy, but it's, you know, it's a little simpler when you, you know, can do like traditional cartoons and exaggerate eyes and, you know, puppy dog eyes and sadness and big friendly mouse. But to do it in this like, heightened realism way of making him look normal and human. But just in this case, he is, he is, he doesn't know what's about to happen and he is nervous and you see it all on this face. It's great. And the first thing she says is, who are you? Um, and then she listens to him and she follows it with, she's listening intently because she follows it with, because he says, uh, he looked like she said, looked, why did you use the past tense? She's just listening, letting him tell his lies. What happened to him? You know, how do you know what his face looked like? She's letting him tell her the story instead of her making assumptions. Cause, uh, you know, one of the easy ways to lie is to let someone tell it for you. So when someone takes an assumption, like, did you do that? I bet you did. You did. You probably did this. You're like you, you killed Cobra commander, didn't you? You want to, you know, if you want them to believe that, then it's, yeah, I did, you know? And so she's putting him in the position of crafting the lie or story or whatever it is. I don't think she trusts him is what I'm saying. Yo, Joe! And again, that panel recurs, that same camera angle. Great. And we see she's thought about it and you get the universal sign for I'm thinking about it with her hand on her chin. It goes back to Rodan's thinker. Great choice there. And she says, pull yourself together. We have an organization to run. She sees an opportunity. She doesn't believe him. She doesn't know what's going on. But what she sees is a way for her to get power at, through a proxy. And he's going to be her proxy. Put the helmet on. You're going to be Cobra Commander. And she doesn't even give him the chance to say yes or no, which is also fabulous. Opens the door. True Cobra Commander is back. And no one is laughing harder than Zartan. Absolutely great. Absolutely hilarious. <laughs> Yo, Joe! And now we're back in Utah for a quick two-page wrap-up. Uh, it's Chuckles and Psych Out, and they're still outside, like, confused. Like, what could possibly have made that thing? Is Those tracks are enormous. Um, they see the, all the lights are on back in the hut, so they're, they're, they think they're going to be in trouble. Some good pacing here. Um, like, to again, you end the page with some tension uh, of Chuckles about to open the door to probably get yelled at. You think he's going to be in trouble. He's got a smile on his face because we, this is character stuff because we're seeing, this is what Chuckles does best. Like talk himself out of trouble. You know, like that's fun. I don't know why we ever hated Chuckles. Probably just the shirt because Chuckles is pretty great. Yo, Joe! And inside there's a party happening. Um, and they don't understand what's happening, but it's literally, it's every Joe, uh, it's all kinds of, they all, they're all dirty. So they all look like they've been working underground, quote unquote, you know, gung ho shipwreck. Let's see. Flint lady J, although they're back from Granada, they don't really seem to care that snake eyes is dead. Um, <laughs> uh, looks like who's that Steeler, um, Rakondo, wild bill a spirit, you know, robe, like, like everybody. Everybody that they, they, they chose to draw, like a lot of dudes, really, going background, you got um, Frostbite, Dusty, 
and they're all uh, they're almost done. It's a, as, as Gung Ho says, a long night work, but we're almost finished. But we don't really know what they're finished with. And then Psychot says, uh, "Where did they all come from? We didn't see any vehicles pull up. And how come they're all grimy, like they've been digging in a dirt?" To be continued. Great little cliffhanger for us. And that's it, guys. GI Joe number sixty-four. Man, that tension between Baroness and Fred. Stop it. I don't think I appreciated those three pages as much that I did when I was a kid that I do today. Those three pages are masterful in showing power dynamics in, in, in acting and in comic book acting and uh, in, in, in pacing to keep your to keep you on the edge of your seat. What's going to happen? You see she's silent. She lets him tell all the tales. And then she sees her moment and jumps in and takes control of the, of the, of the scene, of the momentum of, the, of his entire arc. Awesome. Absolutely a master class. Storytelling. And Russ Heath and Ron White. I mean, if you don't appreciate the art on this, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. I don't, my brain breaks because it's absolutely gorgeous. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, we'll see you next week for another episode of Joe and Joe. And now you, Joe. Enjoying is half the battle.